All right, hello and welcome everyone. Uh, for those of you here in person in Schaumburg, hope you're having a good show. All of the presentations in this room are also being live streamed as part of the NNP Symposium, an online educational conference we've been running since 2020 that is sponsored by the Eric P. Newman Numismatic Education Society. Uh, we partnered with Central States this year for the first hybrid event where we have an in-person audience as well. So for everyone on Zoom, welcome. Um, I expect most of you have probably attended a symposium before, and so you know the drill. Um, so I will get out of the way. For this presentation, we are joined by Carrie Meyer. Uh, she is a museum curator, material culture historian, and library special collections administrator with over 17 years of combined experience. Uh, she's currently an assistant professor and head of special collections and archives at the Leon S. McGugan Magu <laughs> Health Sciences Library at the University of Nebraska Medical Center uh, with master's degrees in museum studies and history. And she also works with Omaha's By Reed collection, which is what we're going to be hearing about today. So here, I'll let you take it away. Thank you all so much. Um, and I just appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk about a collection that is near and dear to my heart. Um, First, though, let me ask, how many have been to the Durham Museum? Anyone? Anyone? OK. And how many have maybe heard of Byron Reed but never seen it? OK. Well, thank you. Yeah, it was a good smattering. And then there's some new folks who've never heard of either. So that's fantastic. Um, <clears throat> so before I go too much further, I want to address a question that's likely in your mind. Why is a health sciences librarian talking about a numismatic collection. Um, so previously, I was privileged to be the chief curator at the Durham Museum for almost 12 years before getting my current role at the uh, McGugan Library. And right on the cusp of getting that position, I was elected to the Board of Governors for Central States for with the, it related to the work with the Byron Reed Collection. And so I was like, I will serve my term and I'm still serving. <laughs> so, uh, so that is why I'm here. And it's, a, it's an absolute privilege um, to do so. I would uh, also like to thank the current collection staff, um, Kristen Rowley, uh, Hayden Nelson and Libby Ray. They are the collections folks at the Durham. They made all the scans plus a lot more that didn't make it into the presentation. And they got it to me within like a week and a half. Uh, so I just wanted to give a shout out to them because without them, uh, all this material would would not have made it uh, in the presentation. So um, I will say, as I, as is in my bio, I'm an art historian, a historian, a curator. I'm not a numismatist. Um, and actually, um, that is particularly important in my line of work, because as a curator in the Code of Ethics, we are not supposed to curate what we collect. Um, that's part of the American Alliance of Museums. Um, and that is uh, one of the things that we uh, hold to is that we do not collect what we curate uh, as a potential conflict of interest. So um, with that, um, I want to say I hope you won't be too disappointed that I won't be going into too many coin facts uh, today. Um, there are so many folks and several in this room who can answer those questions about grading and quality and things like that. Mitch, don't turn around. I know you're there. <laughs> um, and uh, in that type of thing, but what I hope to impart to you is the interesting historical moments that this collection incorporates. A bit about who Byron Reed was. How did his stuff come to be? Um, how do we have it? How is it preserved? And uh, so I have a, a distinct passion for the collection and um, just appreciate you all joining me on this journey. There will be some interactivity, so I will warn you about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'll warn you ahead of time. It, it won't be too painful. So the very first question we should ask, who was Byron Reed? So Byron Reed was born in 1829 in New York. Uh, his ancestry traces back to the Puritans. They came over, uh, William Reed came over in 1635. And so that is where uh, his family starts. In the colonies, he had six brothers and sisters. He only had an eighth grade education. He was an autodidact, which means that he was self-taught. Um, he was an avid reader, musician, and he played the violin proficiently. And again, self-taught. At 16, he taught himself Morse code and became a telegraph operator on the Cleveland and Pittsburgh Railroad lines. And then he was also a newspaper correspondent. In 1855, he went to Leavenworth, Kansas as a correspondent for the New York Tribune. Now, if you know anything about 1855, this was the height of the border ruffian wars, bleeding Kansas, even the Civil War. Um, so Byron Reed was very staunchly anti-slavery in pro-slavery Kansas. He wrote everything anonymously. 
but yet his identity was found out. And he was literally chased out of Kansas. Uh, his, one of his colleagues was caught, was lynched, um, and that's how he went to Nebraska. Uh, so he actually came to Nebraska um, under the cover of darkness <laughs> um, to escape a lynch mob in Kansas. He establishes himself in Omaha in 1856. So the, the use, oh, excuse me, Omaha is only two years old at that point. This is what it looks like. Um, you can see the, the very rough nature of the town. Um, this is the old territorial capital back here. And so this is kind of the main business sector of, um, of Omaha. This was his first real estate office. And it was said to be one of Byron Reed's favorite photographs. So he said he had it a special place on his desk. And it was the beginning of his career as a real estate mogul. He ended up becoming one of the largest landowners west of the Missouri River before his death. In 1862, he meets this wonderful young lady, Mary Melissa Perkins. Um, he and several others were courting her at the same time. They all happened to live in the same boarding house. And Mary Melissa was having some issues with figuring out how she wanted, who she wanted to marry. Uh, so she asked the proprietress, who do you think would be, make the best um, uh, husband? And the lady thought about it for a little bit. And she goes, I think Byron Reed, he'll make the most money. So she said, yes. And Reed did make a lot of money. <laughs> um, and at the time of their marriage, she was 15. He was 33. It was very common at the time. She was the most desirable young lady in Omaha. They had two children. Anna Maria was born a year after their marriage in 1863, and Abraham Lincoln, or A.L. A. L. Reed, was born in 1865. So by the time Mary Melissa is 18, she has two children and her husband. <laughs> I should say too, I'm fighting allergies. I have taken as much allergy medicine as I can. I do apologize. <laughs> so I will try to do my best. Um, so Byron Reed was also involved in a lot of firsts in Omaha. And he rubbed elbows with a lot of the city fathers. Um, it might be hard to see in the audience, but down here on the bottom right corner, um, Byron Reed, Notary Public. So he was working with the First National Bank um, and uh, kind of uh, authorizing their books and different things. Uh, First National Bank was founded in 1857 by brothers Herman, Herman and Augustus Kuntz. Um, they were said to be the first bank in Omaha. But Wells Fargo tends to disagree with them. And so that is a conversation and a controversy for yet another day. Um, but that is First National Bank. It is now known as FBNO. Um, they were said to have been, according to their website, one of the first banks to issue credit cards. So he was involved in that one um, as well. In addition, <laughs> Byron Reed was a historian and a bibliophile. He was fascinated with America, American history and its founding. But he also had an interest in European royalty, the ancient world, and bird watching uh, from the contents of his collection. And for very interesting for his time, he collected from his current historical moment. Uh, this was the Victorian era, the late 1870s, or excuse me, the early 1870s. And um, he collected everything. It was becoming a, a, a sign of wealth and status to collect. Um, before that, it really wasn't. And uh, it, Maybe he was just a sophisticated hoarder um, of things, but he collected a lot of things in his own personal papers. And the most important one um, that ha happened in his lifetime was the Civil War. This is a passport and uh, that allowed him to travel during the Civil War. So this is 1864. And the Civil War was one of the most pivotal and traumatic events for everyone who lived through it. Now, Byron Reed did not fight in the Civil War. I don't know exactly why. Uh, it's possible that he paid the federal government uh, something about $300 to uh, not have to fight. That was very common. It was not badly thought of, but only if you could afford it. So it became kind of known as a, a poor man's war, uh, because if you couldn't pay to get out of the army, you became cannon fodder. Um, Nebraska sent one volunteer regiment out of Plattsmouth, and um, Reed was not in it. However, according to this, he did trans, trans traverse the lines. And this attests that he is not a draftee, but that he could be if Nebraska had a draft. 
And so you could go between the lines and then we have a physical description of him at the bottom. So he's 35 years old, five foot eight with blue eyes, dark hair and dark whiskers. It's the only physical description we have of him um, outside of the black and white photos. So uh, we kind of get an idea of what it is, uh, what he looked like. But this also certifies that one, he was on a deserter and two, he was not a spy, both of which could get you shot. So um, maybe that's why he kept it, but he retained this in his papers and it's still there um, in the collection. And one of the other things that I would tend to get asked a lot about the collection as uh, its curator was how did he get all of his stuff? And this letter uh, gives a little bit of an insight into that. And uh, one of the recipients, the recipient of this particular letter is Mr. E.F. Test. He was a lawyer for Union Pacific Railroad. And he was also one of Byron Reed's requesters. So he writes a lot of letters to different historical figures requesting documents for Reed's collection. And the one that this one is coming to, coming from, back to Test, is Benjamin Harrison. That is this Benjamin Harrison, who was soon to be elected president of the United States um, in 1889. So this is the year previous. And in this letter, this Benjamin Harrison is acknowledging the, that he sent a letter from this Benjamin Harrison to read. This is Benjamin Harrison of Virginia. He was a planter and patriot and delegate to the First and Second Continental Congresses and a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He was also the father of President William Henry Harrison and great grandfather of Benjamin Harrison. And so what this tells us is that Reed's collection had such a national notoriety, even during his lifetime, that the soon to be president is willing to send something from Indianapolis to Byron Reed in Omaha to put in his collection. Now, I don't know what EF test told him or what that means, like why, why that collection had such an, an interest and a renown even at his, in his lifetime, but that would be an ex excellent historical find to know how those items were solicited. And then last but not least, Reed was well known as a numismatist. And this letter um, recognizes his prowess in the financial world, and that in 19, 1890, he was appointed to the President's Essay Commission. And this is the Harrison administration. Hmm. <laughs> I can't say that. I just, I, dates don't lie. <laughs> um, so in any case, uh, Reed was said to have thought that this was the crowning achievement of his life. This is a copy of his response to accepting his position on the Essay Commission. And he thought so much of this appointment that he wrote it down and kept a copy for his own records. That's the only way we know what he said. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, sadly, uh, this was to be his life's culminating act because he did die the next year. Um, and so this was sort of the crowning, crowning glory. Um, he speaks here specifically about testing the US currency and for the uninitiated um, who haven't heard of it before, the assay commissioner's uh, job was to examine and test U.S. coinage to be sure it met, met, met specifications. Um, so it is a wonderful find. Um, it's not something he normally did because we don't have that many copies of his responses inside the collection. So with that, I wanna turn us to a few artifact highlights coins, currency, documents, books, and more. Um, so not to be infomercial about it, but I really hope that I can show a few of my favorites from the collection. There's about 8,000 artifacts uh, in the collection, so we're not gonna go through all of them, I promise. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I, as a historian, I'm, most, I'm so fascinated about how these things travel, what historical moments they were involved in, and then um, kind of how they came to, to the collection. So. I'll just try to share a little bit of that passion and excitement with you um, through a few of these that are my favorites. So the first one is the turtle coin from Aigana, Greece, 6th century BC. To understand this one, um, think of the classical age of Greece, Athens, the Parthenon, democracy. This is where this coin is coming from historically. And this is the time of cementing civilization in the West. So these are some of the earliest coins thought to have been minted in Europe. It's made from electrum, which is a blending of gold and silver. And this hurdle coin, these were known to be correct weight coins. So everyone wanted to trade 
in these coins because they were they knew what the value was. It was a known quantity. They weren't getting um, mixed with uh, different metals. So they were considered to be the perfect trading currency of the time. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, another ancient coin, quite a bit later, <laughs> about 800 years later, um, Egypt is renowned for its ancient, for its queens. And this one is no exception. This is King Arsinoe II. And she at 15 was married to 60 year old King Lys, like, I'm scared, I practiced this too, Lysimachus, um, and the, making her the queen of Thrace, Anatolia, which is Turkey, and Macedon. So 15 years old, she gets married into the court. They start having their own children. She's the second wife. So promptly, as a or late teens, starts poisoning the children of her predecessor <laughs> to secure her children's line to the throne. Um, like I said, renowned for queens. Um, <laughs> and then after her, her husband dies in battle, she returns back to Egypt and succeeds in getting her, her brother's wife, Arsinoe the first, um, exiled. And then she probably turns around and marries her half brother to become queen Arsinoe the second of Egypt. Maybe she's in her twenties at this point. <laughs> um, she was, um, it was unprecedented because she shared all of his titles, including the one that made her a Pharaoh. So this was unusual. We didn't have a lot of female Pharaohs, but she was given the title King of Upper and Lower Egypt. She was her um, a pharaoh and co-ruler in her own right. And then here she is depicted alone on the coinage. This gives an idea of how much power she had in ancient Egypt. Um, after her death, she becomes a goddess. Um, and, in the, and there's reliefs um, at Memphis, Egypt, depicting Ptolemy, her brother, husband, uh, presenting sacrifices to her. You'll see this is the Grecian era of pharaonic Egypt. So her hair is plaited in the Greek uh, manner. She has a diadem rather than the traditional bowling pin looking pharaoh's uh, crowns. And then there is hard might hard to see, but there's a horn, a little thing that curls around her ear. And this was related to Zeus Amun, which was one of the combined Greek and Egyptian principal gods. So it's, it's talking about her divinity on earth, which is very common um, in Egypt at the time. And then on the reverse are two cornucopia uh, espousing the fruits and bounty of Egypt, so is indicating abundance and blessing of the gods. Then we jump forward quite a bit uh, to the only medieval manuscript left in the collection. This is a medieval gradual, it's like a chant book, a song book from liturgical services, and it, we only know it's after 1317. And the reason we know this is that in 2015, in a partnership with the University of Nebraska Omaha, four students came in and went through this book and were looking at its provenance, symbolism, um, the different songs that were in it, all these types of things. And they um, determined that it is calf skin. Um, so you can see the leather and this bottom picture here, calf skin overboard. It's written on parchment. It has original metal stamps and embellishments. It has never been rebound, which is unusual for something of its age. The inscription inside the cover, I will read it to you because it's very hard to see. But as a curator, I was like, this is gold. This is perfect. So the inscription says, a choir book of Gregorian chants at one time in a cathedral in Milan. During the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648, it was stolen and brought to America. Mr. Reed purchased it of a dealer in New York a few years ago, illuminated manuscript of the 15th century. And we were thinking, this is the history, this is great. The artifact's telling us everything we need to know. But everything in that inscription is wrong. <laughs> um, so the student research figured out this book is from the Roman Rite, not Gregorian. Uh, it is from Milan, but it was not in the cathedral. It was uh, owned by the powerful Trivulzio family and it lived in their library. Um, that they had a large coin document and book library and until the 1800s. So it wasn't anywhere stolen in the, in the 1600s. Plus, you know, America didn't really exist in 1648. Um, it was still, it was just a colony of Jamestown. 
It was not sold in the Thirty Years' War. It was sold at auction in 1886 by the George A. Levitt Company. It is not illuminated, so it doesn't have the pictures. It's just the writing. And then the, uh, the blocks you see there is the musical notation. That's an old form of musical notation. There is one pl plausible reason why this story was created. More interest, better sale price. So um, even if it wasn't as juicy as Reed first thought, it's still very, very important. And um, it's an amazing piece to have in the collection. Dr. Saltamachia's students, she's a medievalist at uh, University of Nebraska Omaha, presented their findings in public lectures, one at the museum, one at the university. And then the UNO choir sang the, uh, some of the pieces from this book for the first time in 500 years that anyone had heard them. So it was a wonderful evening. And it has been digitized, it is online. So if you want to see it, you're more than welcome to it. It is on display um, at the uh, museum. <clears throat> so this one is one of my absolute dearest favorites. I love the Medici because I, art historian, love the Florentine Medici. So this is Catherine de Medici. She was um, a Italian who married into the French royal family. This is a document we think in her own hand. Um, it has not been translated. It is written in a very old French. Um, so there's not as many scholars who read this. But um, she had, as I said, in the, in the French royal family, she had 10 children. Three of them became kings of France. One of her daughters married into the Spanish royal family. And her eldest son, Francis, married Mary Stuart, better known as Mary Queen of Scots, which brings her kind of into the Scottish English royal family. She uh, spoke a lot with Elizabeth I. So this is kind of this time period. And this is also the time period of religious conflict in France. Um, Catherine, she is Catholic, um, France is Catholic, but the Huguenots are Protestant. They're fighting against the French Catholicism. And she is trying to figure this out as regent for her second son, Charles. And um, she's not very successful. Uh, the French loathe her, um, even though she's really trying to help them. Um, she didn't have a great maternal instinct, uh, feeling, <laughs> um, all of her children feared her. She was said to have been an extremely fierce person. Um, and even still, her greatest fear was that the, her children would all die and the French royal line would leave her family. And it finally did. Her last son, Henry, um, Henri III, was assassinated about eight months after she died. And he was the last Valois king. And after that, the Bourbon family uh, came on, and then that goes through Louis the Sixteenth, um, and then the French Revolution. So this particular document, again, we don't know exactly what it says. We do know uh, at the very end of the first line it says in England. It's the only thing I can make out. Um, <clears throat> but it's undated, so it wouldn't be a a official diplomatic paper. But it's signed. So if it's something that's personal, um, why why would she sign it? So this is a little bit of an enigma and maybe someday the museum will be able to find somebody to translate it. But until then it's kind of its own little special thing, um, but it's really kind of cool. And I just love the Medici. So I wanted to include it. So Rudolf II, uh, is a contemporary of Elizabeth and Catherine. This is 1605, this document. And the portrait is also included um, in, the, in the collection. Rudolf II was a holy, was the Holy Roman Emperor, a member of the House of Habsburg. He was also a coin collector. Um, and that's one of the reasons I brought his uh, story to you today. He's been traditionally viewed in three ways. An ineffectual ruler who basically started the Thirty Years' War. Um, he was also a great influential patron of Northern Mannerist art. And he was also a devotee of occult arts and learning that helped seed the scientific revolution. He was a reserved, secretive, bit of a homebody. He didn't particularly like being Holy Roman Emperor. He didn't like doing the affairs of state. He was much more interested in being in his library with his coins and his books. And I'm sure none of you have heard that from your significant others um, ever in your lives. <laughs> but uh, he did suffer from periodic bouts of depression, uh, which was common in the Habsburg line. And they 
these would cause him to really sink into that withdrawal. And so that's just some of the, the political uh, background that he would just say, I don't want to deal with affairs of state. I'm just going to be in my library. Uh, he never married, but he had several illegitimate children with his mistress, one of whom was their eldest son, Julius. Now, Julius, um, he... <sighs> His dad kind of doted on him a bit. So Rudolph actually buys him a castle in Bohemia and uh, Julius goes to live there. Um, it's one of the Holy Roman Emperor's principalities, he gets to have his own castle. And then he gets into trouble with the authorities because it's reported that he murdered a local barber's daughter um, who had been living in the castle and like disfigures her body and does all kinds of horrible, nasty things. Um, Rudolph then says he should be in prison for life. Um, but Julius dies within the year. Um, it's believed he was actually schizophrenic and that that is what caused that. So that could have also been some of the things that were affecting Rudolph as well. Um, Rudolph does not, um, because of his lack of prowess with state papers and state things, he actually gets into what's called the long war with the Ottoman Turks. And this is his final undoing He's unwilling to compromise. He's determined to unify all Christendom with a new crusade, crusade. And so he goes to war with the Turks. And it's from 1593 to 1606. <coughs> Excuse me. And then eventually his subjects get tired of this and they start revolting. And this document here pertains to that war. So in the context of this, all of his, um, uh, his, his Hungarian subjects um, say, we're not doing this anymore. And they start revolting. And so his brother, Matthias, is brought forward by the family to take over for Rudolph. They're kind of trying to push him off the throne. And so this particular document is appointing Matthias the Archbishop of Hungary. This was one of Rudolph's stop gaps to say, I'm going to retain power, but I, uh, I'll bring him into the, to the conversation. And his family's like, mm, no, <laughs> you're, you're out. Um, in 1606, Matthias discover, uh, it creates peace with the Hungarians, peace with the Turks. Rudolf is angry. Um, he tries to start a new war uh, against his brother and against the Turks. And eventually he's just forced out completely, uh, is basically a Holy Roman Emperor name only. And then he dies in 1612. Um, and then Matthias becomes the Holy Roman Emperor after that. So this is our, our friend Rudolf. Um, he would, it's one of those things in history where it's like that physical choice of the rulers, if they, if he'd just been able to stay with his interests and his coins, whole wars could have probably been avoided. Um, so he, he just wasn't cut out to be the emperor. Um, <clears throat> this one is kind of moving into the uh, Americas. So jo General James Wilkinson, is the gentleman on the right in the yellow general's coat. He was an American soldier and statesman, but he was a subject of all controversy. So he was twice compelled to resign his commission in the, uh, in the army, once while being part of the Conway Cabal, which was trying to unseat General George Washington as head of the uh, American Revolutionary Army um, in favor of General Horatio Gates. So somehow he survives that. And then he's given the position of a clothier general in the army, but was um, compelled to resign because of lack of aptitude for the job. Um, yet still, he's involved in all of the uh, political machinations of the new republic or the new, uh, yeah, the new republic and the nation. In 1804, 1805, he starts working with this gentleman here on the left. That is Aaron Burr. He is the vice president at the time. He's just killed Alexander Hamilton. Um, and uh, so he was already a very reviled figure and it's called the Burr Conspiracy, which was the alleged treasonous plot planters, politicians and army officials to basically take the center part of the US and make it their own country. Um, Wilkinson, we don't know exactly what was going on. He, he supposedly works with Aaron Burr on this, but then he turns around and says, tells President Jefferson, that this is happening and it's Burr's idea. And then he uh, testifies against Burr. Well, then people that hate Wilkinson are like, oh no, it's his idea. And Burr's just the scapegoat. Regardless, both of them are very reviled after this. Everybody hates them. Uh, Burr is actually acquitted 
and it basically kills anything that was going to be um, possible in his political career. Wilkinson gets off scot-free. He is not indicted at all. But this book in the Byron Reed collection is the entire case of why Wilkinson should have been indicted um, and why it was all his fault. <laughs> um, and that he should have been uh, convicted of treason this time uh, instead of all the other times. Um, so despite all of that, Jefferson still makes him the governor of the Louisiana Purchase, Louisiana Territory. So he goes out to the Midwest and he's still not happy. So he ends up getting involved with Spanish um, espionage with Spanish uh, agent 33 um, out of Mexico and is eventually removed from office for being publicly uh, criticized for heavy handed administration and abuse of power. He then goes into Mexico in the 1820s and ends up dying there. Um, and he is actually buried in Mexico City. A couple years later, we go back to Britain. And this book is one of three that is thought to have survived. The other two, one is in London, one is in Australia, and one is in Omaha. So this book is the entire investigation uh, presented to King George III's advisors into the contact, conduct of Princess Carolina Wells. She was the wife of George III, or excuse me, George IV. And so while George III is alive, she is um, accused of impropriety and having born a child that was not her husband, uh, the Prince of Wales' child. So the majority of this book is witness statements and letters uh, from the princess to the king and others that are printed verbatim. This is the ultimate palace leak of its time. Um, and subsequently, according to the uh, inscription in the front, this book was bought up and suppressed after a very few copies had been issued as high as 1,500 pounds. And when Byron Reed wrote this, it was $7,500, was paid for a single copy. Um, the honorable, the author, the honorable Spencer Percival was assassinated and killed in the House of, the, of Commons on May 11th, 1812. So it was quite the, quite the thing. Um, if you, in case you're curious, 1,500 pounds in 1891, uh, excuse me, 1812, would be about $116,000 today. So people were paying that much to see what this thing said. Um, and that's why there's only three of them left. Uh, so the way this all comes about, George, Prince of Wales, and future George IV, he has his Catholic mistress. He loves her. The crown says, absolutely not. You can't marry her. <clears throat> You have a bunch of debts. Your cousin has lots of money, marry her. And so he does um, because that's what marriages are built on. Um, and he did not find her in any way attractive. He, uh, after they had their, their child, I believe it was a daughter. Um, he says, done with you. You can go do whatever you want. Um, I'm, I'm done uh, basically being your husband uh, in anything but name only. So she takes him at his word. And then this is where the investigation comes from because she retires to her estate in Blackheath, London, and her behavior just becomes a little extreme. Um, after she's found uh, uh, exonerated, she, they can find no evidence that she actually was doing all the things that people said about her. She goes to Europe and becomes the mistress of Napoleon's brother-in-law. So that makes things better. Um, and then in January, 1820, things get real interesting because King George III dies. Now her husband is king. She's on the continent. She wants to come back as queen. And parliament says, we will pay you 50,000 pounds to stay there. <laughs> and she says, nope, I'm the queen. And so she comes back. And so the Lord, the House of Lords probably launches a divorce proceeding. They never had relations. That child's not theirs. Everything like that. The London people love her. They think she is awesome. So every time she leaves her home in London to go to Parliament as far as these divorce proceedings, they follow her. And it's because of this public pressure outside the House of, um, the House of Lords that after 52 days, they say, okay, we're not gonna, we're not gonna pursue this anymore. You'll fine, you will be queen. George is furious. 
But his frustration doesn't last very long because 19 days later, she dies. Um, we don't know why, natural causes, um, but uh, the London, London goes into mourning. People are just so, so overwrought with this. And on her, um, her coffin, or excuse me, um, her, oh yes, on her coffin, it was an inscription that was placed on the top that said Caroline, the injured queen of England, uh, because she was never crowned, uh, but they still saw her as their queen. So yeah, one in London, one in Australia, one in Omaha. Pretty cool. So the other thing that Byron Reed has a lot of in his collection are store tokens, um, as well as settler tokens. And this one is for the pistol and rifle galleries in Philadelphia, basically an advertisement of services and activities at the location. So on the one side, Mr. William Long uh, is telling you where to find him in Philadelphia. And he definitely wants you to know he's a member of the Masonic Lodge um, with the, uh, the compass in the middle. And then on the other side, he's the proprietor of a very multi-interested establishment. There's a restaurant, a museum, a hotel. You can um, look at pistols and rifles. You can play shuffleboard in Vagas Hall. You can get liquor, oysters, and cigars, S-E-G-A-R. Um, and you can play billiards and go bowling. So a little bit for everybody. But what's super interesting <laughs> excuse me, is this image here in the middle. This is a puzzle. So I told you it was going to be interactive. So here we go. I've been talking a lot. Let's see if we can figure out what it is. This is a puzzle. Anybody think they see any anything they can make out? Anyone on Zoom, you're welcome to send yes. again in the Q&A and Please. I will read it off. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. It is a word. Any thoughts, any ideas? I'm going to step out of my little box here, but I want to point. <laughs> okay, so this thing here, it's a B. R. Does anybody recognize what that is? I. I. L, 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 I, I, and. Now I'll tell you, I'm not brilliant because I didn't get it. <laughs> but one of my interns was. <laughs> um, so when, when I was curator, one of my interns, Marsha Bennett, would volunteer every week to go dust the Byron Reed exhibit so she could spend time. She was going to figure this thing out. Took her three semesters and she was the one who did it. So full credit to Marsha Bennett as the brilliant intern of the Durham Museum because that uh, it took years, decades, folks. Nobody figured it out. <laughs> so, but she was determined and so it was amazing. So full credit to her for that. So a couple more here before we end. Uh, this is a Republic of Texas 75 cent note. And this one is fun because I it's 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 pretty fragile, it's pretty thin, but I would still let our summer camp kids, when they would come through the collection, I'd let them hold it. And um they were all like, ah, eh, whatever. Uh, and I'm like, oh, but but wait. Um so this was printed in 1843 uh by the then independent Republic of Texas. Uh, because gold and silver were scarce, Texas printed all of its denominations on paper. And this money could only be used to pay government transactions or taxes. And it was only effective during the 10 years that Texas was its own country. So 1836 to 1846, um, they, they, Texas joined the US on uh, December 29th, 1845, so close enough. Um, and so they printed just over $4 million in paper currency. Now, I know there are several of these that are very, very rare but I've also been told that this one is the only one that has yet been discovered left in the world. Um, the reason is, we think. Um, we don't know exactly how Reed acquired it, but this, this piece is adhered to the top of a portrait of Sam Houston, whose signature is right there. Maybe that's why it was um, saved 
and never redeemed uh, because Texas was very, very careful about their notes. And so when they were redeemed, they were canceled or destroyed or burned. Um, there also is possibility that this is 1843 and it's only goes through 1845, 46. Maybe there wasn't time for the bearer to get back to redeem it. We don't know. But in any case, um, the note would have been rendered useless as a form of currency after 19, 1845. And so we now have it in the collection at the, at the Durham. Um, and the last uh, valuation that we had was $64,000 for that piece of paper. And so when I would have the kids all hold it, I say, now you can go home and tell your parents you got to hold $64,000 today. <laughs> and they're all like, uh -huh. <laughs> um, I thought it was a funny joke. <laughs> Um, this one's, they're all my favorites, but I, I really do enjoy this one. Uh, this one is Edouard Laboulet, um, is a, a letter that he's sending to the Richmond Daily Wick. Does anybody recognize the name Laboulet? No, okay. So the clue is this picture. Edward Laboulet was one of the architects of the Statue of Liberty. And so this is a press release uh, announcing that the Statue of Liberty is going to be built in New York Harbor. And this is what he calls a photography of it, of the drawing of what it will look like on Liberty Islands. Um, so uh, this one, um, well, this is announced in 1875 and the statue is not dedicated until 1886. Um, and so that is just a extremely unique um, piece um, that is still in the collection. And yet no tour of Byron Reed would be complete without the King of American Coins. It's the claim to fame of Omaha, yeah. um, besides Warren Buffett, <laughs> um, that uh, yes, Byron Reed did own one of the most famous American coins. This is the Parmalee 1804 dollar. It was purchased in 1890, again, the year before Reed died. Um, so very late in his life. Um, and so with, for my former third graders uh, in the that were touring the museum, I would ask them what's so interesting or important about this coin. And I was like, so I'd say, um, well, it's, it's one of only eight of its, of its class in existence. It's the only one of two places you can see it on public display. The other one being the A&A Museum in Colorado Springs. I think it's still there um, on display. Um, the other six are known and in private collections, last I knew. Um, and I would always say, um, you know, these coins, um, you know, what do, what do you think it's worth? And they would all be like, thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars. I'd be like, it's worth a buck. Because <laughs> I'm like, take it to Dollar Tree, you can't even buy a stick of gum with this. Like, it's buck 25. <laughs> but if you take it to an auction house, um, I, you know, the last one went in 2021 for 7.68 million dollars at Stax Bowers, and their eyes would get like this. And then all of a sudden they thought coins are pretty cool. <laughs> um, so these coins were actually created in 1834 as parts of currency sets commissioned by Andrew Jackson as gifts for foreign dignitaries. Um, the last coins had the 1803 year that were minted in 1804, and then the mint ceased production until the 1840s. Um, but uh, Jackson had asked for, for these specific sets uh, to be created. So yes, it's, uh, I would always tell that story first because then suddenly these nine-year-olds would be like, ooh, I'm going to listen to you for the rest of this tour because <laughs> this is actually kind of cool stuff. <laughs> so now we return back to Mr. Byron Reed himself. Uh, as I said, he died in 1891. He was only 62 years old. And upon his death, he gifted his entire collection to the city of Omaha. The land and money were acquired to build the new library building at 19th and Harney, and it's still there today. It was designed by famous Omaha architect Thomas Kimball, and there is a picture of it. Um, the Reed collection was about 17,000 pieces at the time, and it was housed on the top floor um, of, the, of the library. Um, it is, was then and is still today owned by the city of Omaha. At his death, we, Reed was considered the wealthiest man in Nebraska. His estate was uh, valued at two and a half million dollars. As of 2022, that would be about 83.5 million. So he doesn't break the top 100 richest men in the world still, but it was pretty good for that time period. 
Um, from the 1890s to at least the 1960s, the collection was completely accessible. You go in, you could look, you could roam, you could rummage. Nobody's watching you. There's no security. It, 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 it was for the citizens of Omaha. That was in Reed's will. There are at least 11 documented thefts in the Omaha newspapers during that time period. Um, in the 1960s, uh, well, and that those are the documented ones of large amounts of the coins being stolen or different items. Who knows how many things were pocketed, swapped, you know, people wanted a piece of Omaha history. I mean, libraries are notorious for having things not returned, right, Sam? <laughs> so, but in the mid 1960s, at least the coin portion is transferred to a bank vault. So it is now secured. Um, the books and the documents remain in the library and throughout its time there, the library is adding to it. This is a common library practice um, to add to the collection. Um, and it is also thought of as the spirit of Reed and his will. He was a collector, he wanted to expand this knowledge. And so they kept adding to it. Um, so then in the 18, excuse me, 1980s, the uh, city council votes to move the entire collection from the Omaha Public Library to the, the then Omaha History Museum, which is today the Durham Museum. And it was not originally in this gallery, but this is a picture of what the gallery, this is about half of the gallery, what it looks like today. Um, and in the mid nineties, there was the infamous and unfortunate sale of portions of the collection that uh, went forward despite some museum and much public pushback against it. Um, there were many, many things wrong with those actions. I won't go into them unless there are questions. <laughs> um, but as the owners of the collection, the city council voted, and that was the last word. Reed had no provision in his will to prevent a sale of portions of his collection. And so approximately half was sold. So there's only about 8,000 pieces left of the 17,000. But still, all these wonderful stories, all these wonderful historic pieces have remained. And uh, since then, um, and when I was there as well, the museum has undertaken to care for and document the collection. Um, as I said, there's the permanent exhibit gallery. The coins do not rotate, but the books and documents rotate every six to nine months. This is a preservation uh, thing, but also being able to share more of these stories with the public. Um, because in its way, and in through this public display, the Durham Museum keeps the goal of Byron Reed's collecting vision alive. It is for the citizens of Omaha and all those who come to visit. So with that, I thank you for taking this trip through some of the history with me of the Byron Reed collection. I hope you have a better appreciation of who he was and what he collected and what's important about it. Um, this is my con contact information if you want to reach out to me. There is also the, um, the uh, website for the Durham Museum. Please go see it. Um, I do have some rat cards about the Byron Reed collection that the museum provided me as well as my business card. So, um, and if you have specific questions that I can't answer, um, there is a, a notebook up here. You can jot your name and email and your question down and I can get it to the museum um, and we can get back to you for sure. So with that, I am happy to answer any questions that you have. All righty. Um, so we will have questions both from in the room and over Zoom. Um, so for those over Zoom, there's a button at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. Just type them in there and I'll read them off. Um, for those of you in the room, we'll be alternating between the two. I think we got the audio sorted out so I no longer have to repeat all of the in-room <laughs> questions so Zoom can hear them. Um, so people online, if you have trouble hearing people from the audience, just let me know in that Q&A and I'll go back to repeating them. But, um, okay, so we have a comment in Zoom but no questions in there yet. Um, are there any questions from in the room? It is the 1804 dollar on permanent display. It is. Okay. Yes, it's part of a treasures case of the five rarest coins in the collection. Okay. Um, and then the coins, coins are really hard to, to display in mm -hmm. setting. I'm just kind of curious how you yeah. have, have things arranged. So it has the individual coin um, and then two enlarged images of it. So very similar to what I was doing in the PowerPoint. Um, and then a lot, several of them, many of the things like the paper currency, a lot of the documents, some of the coins um, have been digitized and are available through the content DM um, online collection for the, for the museum. So there is a section for Byron Reed collection 
And so you can feel free to surf that through your home. Um, and if there's anything, any questions, there's an easy button to get in touch with the museum staff about that, so. All right. Um, then we have had some come through online. Uh, does the faculty plan to have the ancient French translated? Um, I hope they will. <laughs> um, you know, we we had reached out when I was there as the curator. I tried to find someone who knew that old French. Uh, there was a gentleman in the history department who said he was he knew some of it, but it would take him probably six to eight months to, to translate it. Uh, for the museum, it comes down to budget. Um, they just haven't had the, been in the position to put the money toward translating it. Um, if it was a, a, a newer French, it'd be a lot quicker, but because of that time investment, the University of Nebraska faculty will want to be compensated. So um, rightly so, it's, it's a very unique language, um, version of the language, I guess you'd say. Um, so I hope they do. I have been wanting to do it for years, uh, but I sadly uh, barely speak English. So uh, it's probably not a good idea for me to try. <laughs> All right, do we have any else in the room? Yeah. I visited many years ago, and I'm, I'm thinking the coins were certified by NGC. Is that right? Are they certified? There was, I think it was during the sale, um, if I remember correctly. I know there was a grading service present. Uh, Mitch, do you remember if it was NGC? No, it was not. It, was, uh, it wasn't any of the three top groups. It was... I can't remember off the top. Of my yeah, head. It, it was an odd choice when we put it there. Yeah, and I don't know. Uh, there was nothing documented as to how that choice was made um, in the '90s. I'm not sure if that was a city council thing, a museum thing. Um, I know they worked with the Omaha Coin Club at the time, but I'm not sure how all that came together. But there was some sort of grading done. We do have um, a, a binder. Actually, it's eight binders of all of the coins that are still in the collection that were graded at so at the mid 90s what that grade would have been so that that information can be made available i don't believe they digitized that all right well, it looks like we have some more online here um what is today's value of the collection ah. <laughs> <laughs> that is a really good question so um you know i don't know the last time they had an appraisal done um it was before before I got there, the collection was round about two and a half million. Um, and that was not including all the documents. It was just coins. Um, and so it was just, um, it was very, very long time ago. And it was something that I advocated for. And again, budget became an issue. Uh, so that has not, it has not been valued uh, today. So I usually try to get examples of different coins of various types that were sold at auction and use that as a, a percentage of how much it has increased in uh, overall for the insurance valuation for the administration. Um, but I'm not sure what that would be at this point. I've been gone about four, four years now. So I'm not sure what that would have been. I tried to keep up with it when I was there. Okay, sorry, I don't have a number. <laughs> <laughs> the room, yes. Um, you have to know what the proceeds from the auction were actually used for? Yes. Um, so this was one of the things that were wrong. <laughs> the um, museum needed a new roof. Um, so the uh, collection was auctioned for a roof. Um, in the museum world, uh, that is one of the biggest no-nos, um, uh, not just um, for the altruistic like preservation of, of the collection in the uh, vein of what the donor would want, but also museums are ethically bound that if you sell a portion of the collection, then those proceeds should go back to the remainder of the collection to take care of that collection. Um, and so that was not done. Uh, that's why I said there's, there were many things wrong with that sale. Um, but without that too, devil's advocate, um, the museum building was would not, um, would not be in the state that it's in today with its preservation as well. So yeah, it did also establish part uh, an endowment for the collection that the city um, manages for the museum. Um, so some of it did go back as it should have, but yes, um, a roof was was a, uh, installed, a new roof for the building. Okay. Um, do you know at what age Mr. Reed started collecting coins? 
So probably in his 50, uh, late 40s. Uh, so it was about 1871 to 73 is kind of what we we're estimating. And then he was going and acquiring pieces from auctions. He would have folks that would let him know when things were up that he might be interested in um, and would send them to him. Um, you know, with the Parmalee sale, we know he went to that sale. Um, so he he did start acquiring it about his late 40s because that was about when he started getting his his real estate empire really going. So, okay, any in the room? Yes. Kind of follow up on that. Yeah. Is there any records that survive of the man and where he purchased items in his collection? Some. Uh, it looks like, I mean, we have a couple ledgers, okay. but it's really hard to tell what he's recording in there. He's using a shorthand that uh, he didn't leave a key for. <laughs> um, and there's only a couple. And so we're not 100% sure how he was doing it. Most of our provenance research is trying to find the particular coins in the auction catalogs. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't account for any personal transactions that he would have done. But like the, the champ book, uh, the gradual, excuse me, they were able to track that down through the auction catalog. Mm -hmm. And that's what really unlocked all the history. Um, but now we don't know exactly how he got a lot of stuff. He was a very private person, <laughs> extremely private, like didn't like to talk about himself at all. <laughs> um, has the museum considered creating a virtual tour of the collection akin to that of the a, &A Money Museum? I so wish they did. <laughs> um, I think again, it's a more of a money of uh, a budget thing um, that had been, we had talked about several digital versions when I was there. Um, there is no software that they currently have that would do that. And they do not have, um, let's see, since I was there, uh, they've had to reduce the curatorial staff um, a bit uh, with COVID and things like that. So I don't know that there is any uh, current plans for that. I hope that someday they will. Um, it would be a great project. I will say that they did have a student uh, from UNO who was doing a digital humanities project. And he took, I think, 30 of the coins and created 3D digital models of them. And that is available online. Um, I don't know if it's linked from their website, but I do have that link. Um, I just did not put it in the presentation, but that does exist. So there, if there are projects or theses or things that people are trying to do that could help the collection, they are all for that collaboration. Okay, anyone else in the room? No, I don't see any hands and we don't have anything else online. Uh, Okay, so last chance to send in questions online. I'll ask again one more time in the room. Otherwise, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, also, for those of you online, uh, she, Carrie mentioned the uh, handouts and business cards. I will have a copy of those. And if you would like to see those, send a contact form through the symposium website, and I'm happy to send you pictures of those uh, so you have that information. Um, that's just on the symposium website. Go to contact us and let me know what you need. Um, otherwise, all of these talks are being recorded. The recordings will be up on the NNP about two weeks from Saturday. Um, if you are not registered for the symposium, which is likely people here in person and not online, um, and you would like to receive an email when those recordings are available, we encourage you to register. It is entirely free and takes about two minutes. Um, both.